And welcome back, everyone, to another Pivot Podcast. So glad you could be here. My name is Tracy, and I am once again joined with my amazing co-host, Mr. Dan Jansen. How are you, sir? Doing terif- terrific. This this month so far has been absolutely incredible, breaking down uh, a real-life coaching session with Mike Pickett. And this is episode three. I can't believe we're here already, but this is episode three. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into how to trade with a small account. Uh, also, where the candle locations matter. And looking for certain setups such as reversal plays, hammers, things like that, as to where you might want to get in. So this is very, this is going to be a very informative uh, thirty minutes, and I'm I'm excited for it. Yeah, you bet. So let's dive into part three. We'll see you there. Do you recommend people in in my boat? Where you know I am at a nine to five job. <clears throat> Stick with swing trading for a while until I get you know, I get comfortable with it, or do you suggest that I I do play a little bit with uh, some of the day trading since I also have the capabilities of coming in my office and and checking it every so often? So, so I don't know. I'll let Dan answer this after I do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You may or may not agree with me, but my opinion is if you can't swing trade effectively or profitably, day trading is not going to be profitable for you. So, everything is fractal in the market. It's all scalable. And that includes your setup. So even setups that you have for swing trading could potentially be good setups for day trading just on a smaller time frame. And so until you're able to profitably swing trade, that's my opinion. I think you should stick to swing trading. Dan, what are your thoughts? Go all in day trading. Well, no, I'm just kidding. No, uh, the complete opposite of what Tracy said. No, I, I can't agree more with Tracy. I was going to say the same thing. Um, it All day trading is, I know people get a little intimidated by day trading because things happen so much quicker. But if you're if you're getting good at day trading or swing trading, your setups a lot of the time, it's usually you're looking for the same exact, you're looking at the same exact candles. Everything's just on a smaller time frame, uh, And that's really the only difference of day trading and swing trading. So Swing trading, at least you could breathe. You don't have to panic. Uh, if you're finding trouble controlling emotions on a swing trade, it's going to be you might as well speed dial an ambulance to, to, to come to your house before the market opens because you're going to need it quick. Like you're going through emotions very quickly um, or, or the emotions will kick in. But if you have a plan, ideally you're trading like a robot, not so much how you personally think or believe a stock should move. Yeah, and a lot of people will... I, I think they flip over to day trading because they think that's what they need to do to make more money. And I can assure you that you can, first of all, be profitable swing trading. You can also make a living swing trading. We have quite a few traders in the real life trading community. That's all they do is swing trade and they make more than enough money to live off of. So there's no necessity to rush into day trading. It's take your time, Make sure that you understand your system and your rules. Make sure that you understand the market. Ease into it. Give yourself that cushion to make those decisions because that's that's really what it's about. I mean, if you were to become a firefighter and then not have the time to practice or not have the time to build those skills and all of a sudden you're just jumping into a fire, there's going to be a lot of accidents that happen. And yeah. it takes time. What about... Um... You know, I've heard people, you know, I've got friends who have never swing trade or day trade, but they jump straight into options, which I'm just not ready for. I know that. Um, but they're doing very, very well at it. Now, it's still, maybe their brain is wired different than mine, but uh, they seem to be successful. And, and I'm just confused at every single video I'll watch about it. Maybe. And, and again, if you can't, as far as I'm concerned, if you can't trade candles, you're not going to be able to trade options. That's my opinion. I, again, a lot of people jump into options because they've got a smaller account. The problem is, I think a lot of people don't know how to manage their risk appropriately either in options. And I think that there's a lot of people that are probably over leveraged with options. And it's it could even be one of the leading factors, in my opinion, once again, to uh, why people blow up their accounts because they don't actually realize that they're over leveraged. They're using a small account thinking, wow, well, I can hit it really big. And that's great. And um, honestly, 
if if they aren't able to trade shares profitably, I would venture to guess that they're just lucky. So how, how long have they, uh, your friends, how long, at least are you aware that they've been trading options for? Um, less than a year. Less than a year. Uh, ask them in five years how they're doing. You have, you have a sample size of a year. Um, the way, the way that we manage risk, because I mean, if you, if you're like, Hey, you know what? My account's a thousand dollars and I could care less about the thousand dollars. My main goal is just to get to 25,000. We could probably get you there very soon. I mean, we, we could probably take some, some riskier option plays and get a thousand times return. It's it happens all the time in options, but then what? Right. So like, even I, I've had friends that made like uh, it was last January made one point two million dollars on options for GameStop in January. He was he would have a fifty thousand. He makes a lot of money. He's uh he makes a ton of money with with his job of a like tech security company, whatever it is. But he would before he got to that one point two million, he was comfortable. He was just reading the odds. He goes, "I'm gonna probably lose fifty thousand dollars multiple times." And he did like he lost a, a lot of money before he hit the 1.2 million, but he was comfortable because he could always re up his account. Like, cause he, he had money coming in and is, is not a concern. Right. So it's all, it's all depending on what you do and how much money you have coming in and, and what that was that's worth for you. The guys that typically hit GameStop and made like, he's still hanging on, but most of them that hit big or hit that lottery ticket, the Dogecoin, they had some Bitcoin plays. They had uh, AMC trades they might've made a ton of money in options, but it doesn't really mean they know what they're doing. It's, it's easy to make the money. It's harder to hold on to the money. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope for your friend's sake that they, they are able to take that money, either put the time into, to understand the markets and really understand what they're doing, the trade setups, if they haven't already, um, or two, just pull money out and buy real estate or something else that, that they could actually own some kind of asset with. Because a lot of times you could hit trades. Like I, I could probably tomorrow at, at open find some trades that will hit 100, 200, 300% return on options. But it's also a good chance that I could just lose all that money that I put in. So um, having the, the question is, do you want to get rich quick or do you want to be consistently profitable? For me, I'd rather be consistently profitable where I, I know exactly before I get into a trade, how much I'm losing. I know that's not going to blow up my account. I know I'm going to have another trade after it. And I know the math works. I mean, it's a simple, the R system is a simple, simple math problem equation where I know, I mean, even, even on that 2.4 scenario, I know you're moving targets and things like that. For me, I'd rather just take that 2.4 if it gets there, because what does that do? That gives me two, two possible losing trades. I could take right after it. If I, if I take two more trades after it and I lose a full R on both of those trades, well, I made 2.4, I lost an R, I lost an R. I'm, I'm shooting as a 30%, 33% winner in the markets and I'm still up 0.4. That's a simple math that I like for me personally, where I know I could scale that out. If you have a if you have a thirty dollar R, and you make 0.4, okay, it's not a lot of money. But if you're building your account consistently, and you're getting your R to a thousand, I think Jeremy bumped his R up to five thousand. A 0.4 after three trades, most of them being losers, that's a that's still a good win. It's just it's the R doesn't the system of how you trade doesn't trade the dollar value behind the R changes and that's based off your account. So for me, I can make I, I can make just as much money as somebody trading options, but I don't have to be as risky doing it just because I'm building the account slowly. And there there is a difference. I think we get asked all the time, and I've heard it before that uh, you know trading the stock market is like gambling. And my opinion is the way that Dan and I trade, it's not gambling. There's, there's no gamble at all. It's very calculated. It's a skill set. We're, we're actually trading. There's, there are people that gamble in the stock market. And when you start doing, I think things like trading options and you don't really understand what you're doing, that's where you're gambling. And just like regular gambling, there's going to be times where you hit it big. And there's a lot of times where you're going to hit it, hit it terribly, terribly wrong. And that's just the way it is. So if you want to learn how to trade, then there's one path. If you want to gamble, then there's another path. It's up to you, right? right. Do you um, do you think that 2.4 is where I should always 
especially in the beginning, stick for my targets? Or do you think as a, as a rookie, maybe drop it down to a two? For me personally, I, I don't mind a two R target. The 2.4, because you're swing trading, so like in, in day trades, uh, I'm usually going for about two R's. Depending on the trade, I might do- either during the trade or just based on how the chart looks or where my entries and stuff, I might say, yeah, you know what? This thing has potential to hit three R's. You, you mentioned before that other people that you talk to, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm up uh, five R's on a trade. That's fantastic. Um, but for me, especially, like, like I said, the timing for what time of the year it is, how – my other trades have gone that will determine where I really need to go for me. I'd rather lock in the two R's on, on a trade off the bat. If, especially if it's my first, first trade, second trade of the year, or I'm coming in and I'm a beginner, just brand new to the industry. Because now, like I said, the math works where, all right, even if, if I could lock in a two R trade and it doesn't mean I'm, I'm just waiting, 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 I'm going to move my stops appropriately where my plan says. And maybe I, maybe I, get stopped out and have a 0.7 R win. All right. There's nothing I can do. I mean, my original target was still two R's or 2.4. Um, but the idea is that you're, you're winning on certain trades, hitting those R's where you could lose enough on other trades and still be profitable as a trader. So I don't think you have to go like, if I, if I hit, if I'm up six R's for the month, then yeah, maybe I'll go for like a 2.4 target. If, if the chart shows that I, it's potential for me to get there. So it just, it's just risk management. I, I want to get profitable and stay profitable. So however I could do that, the more I'm up, the more I could let things ride a little bit more for me. So like if it's sometime in July and I'm up 45 hours for the month and I'm like, you know, this could be a good trade. I want to see if this could hit three hours based on this, this, this. Then I, as long as I'm able to move my stops where I'm either slightly above break even or it's giving me the actual chart where I can move my stops up higher and no matter what, I'm locking half R. Then, I, then for me, I'll try to let things run a little bit more because I have the flexibility. If I'm up 45 R's uh, at that point and I'm only losing in R on this trade if it doesn't work, but not really because I'm moving my stops up and I'm either half R of risk or slightly positive or whatever the case, it's not going to define my, my entire year. I, I, would say, I would say, too, the guy that hits five R's in a trade, like would you rather – because it could get close. It could reverse. News could come out as you're in the trade and you, you had a great trade that, that turns into a loser. Would you rather hit one trade every three months for a five hours? Or would you much rather have two hours, but consistently two hours a day? Definitely the two hours consistently. I'd rather hit the two hours a day instead of the one trade. The, the ones that people post, that's their five hour win. That's their 20 hour win because they took an option play or something like that. And they're calculating their, their hours all, all crazy. But you don't hear about the losers. You don't hear about the, the other trades. i much rather know, cool, I'm just a consistent profit, profitable trader because I know long term, my goal is to build the account. I want to increase my R's because then if I need, like if you have a $1,000 account and your R is uh, $20, right? It's tough to make a living, like to cover your bills and, and pay a mortgage or car payments, but I can scale it up. So now if my R is $1,000, how much, like how many R's at, at $20, if you have a $20 R, how many R's do you need to pay your bills? Right. I'm not asking this rhetorical. Right. You might need a thousand R's that month, right? That's stressful to get a thousand R's in one month just to cover your bills. But as you're scaling up the account and you have the luxury where you, you have income, which is the greatest source to wealth, right? So you have income coming in now. You don't have to leave your job now. It's not really part of your plan. It sounds like you like what you do, but you have that income coming in. And while that income is coming in, you have the luxury of building an account slowly. Right. And then you're getting to that point where you're learning, you're getting paid to learn essentially. So you're growing the account and then, yeah, you know what? My R is now $50. My R is $100. My, my R is $200. And you're getting to the point where, okay, you, you might have a thousand dollar R. Now, how many R's do you need a month to, to pay bills? Two, three, four, like whatever, whatever it is. It's a lot, stre- it's a lot less stressful having a bigger R if, if you're relying on it for certain bills and things like that. But at this stage, I think honestly, you're just, you're, you're not in it. You didn't sign up for the market to make a lot of money today. It's a learning process. And, you, and I think you understand that. So you're going through that, that just the learning curve of the markets. I'd rather, I'd rather take a lot more losses at a $20 R than a thousand dollar R, right? I'd rather figure it out now than later. So by building it 
consistently, that's that's probably the best way to 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 grow the accounts. I would agree with Dan as well. Um, I I don't trade an arbitrary R though. I don't target an arbitrary R. I I think it's a great way for beginner traders to build their accounts, and I think that's great. I think the next progression though is to look at levels. And that's the way that I trade. So I'd be looking at a, a, a good, strong resistance level or a good, strong support level. Those are the things that where I would be looking to take my targets. Um, as a new trader, though, you don't have the technical skills yet to really identify what is a good, strong level. So playing with a defined target like a 2.4R is a great way to to get your account building up. And then later on, as you develop your skill, you become more familiar with the markets. You're able to identify support resistance a lot better. That's where you can transition into more of a, a support resistance or a levels guy and maybe get some of those bigger targets later on. I know, Tracy, your, your favorite candle is, is also the hammer. Uh, does it matter whether it's red or green to you? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. But the level, as Dan said late, earlier, location, location, location. As far as I'm concerned, a hammer is just like real estate. You can buy a hammer in the middle of, is you know, Back Hills, Arkansas, or you can buy a hammer in the middle of New York City, and one of them's going to pay you out, and the other one's not. So, it's really about location. Now, again, as you start out, your your skill set is going to move, or your your success rate with a hammer is going to move as your skill set improves. So that means your ability to identify good, strong support resistance levels. As you get better at that, you're going to be able to pick better hammers. And that comes with practice and time. So you're going to have a lot more losses now, but that is one of the one of the candlesticks, I think, that if you stick to it, it's only going to get better and better and better as you become a better trader. Now, Dan, I know, I know you like hammer candles, but is that your favorite or do you have a favorite? I love the hammer candles. I'm primarily I'm looking for hammers throughout the day, but at I I do a lot with the Elliott Wave count for my locations. Um, so I play a lot of reversals on trades, and I'm looking for. And if if uh, somebody's listening to to this or or you want to check it out too, um, you could search Elliott Wave theory. And then put real life trading, just put that into YouTube. So Elliott Wave Theory, real life trading. I think Jeremy has probably one of the best videos personally that I've seen that really, because there's a lot of like technicals in it and stuff like that. And it, it becomes a little bit, Elliott Wave Theory is more of an art, not a science. So it's not like uh, this candle has, to, this, this wave has to be this long for this to, which I mean, people like, but it's more of an art, not a science. So you're, you're kind of, in the beginning, it's very difficult to understand like what wave you're in and all that stuff. I think Jeremy's video honestly was probably one of the best because it, it explained the sentiment of why the Elliott wave theory makes sense, um, what to look for in the Elliott wave theory. So I combined that and I'm just waiting for it to get to those certain, at the end of those certain wave counts. And then I'm looking for some kind of hammer to come in or, or um, something like that. For me, I would say it doesn't really, like Tracy said, it doesn't really matter too much what color the candle is, the red or green. But if you're taking a bullish play, yes, I, I personally would love to see a red candle, a, a red hammer first, just because you're looking as it breaks that that red ham, hammer, you're actually trapping a little bit more people into that candle. So there's more people that either went short at some point in that candle and you're just trapping a little bit more. So typically for me, I find it works a little bit better, but uh, I mean, a hammer's a hammer and it just, I mean, we're, we're, we're probably picking threads on that, but I, there is, there's a, certain sentiment in there where you, you, even in that one candle, you're also trapping some additional people. So the, the fact that I could realize that more people are getting trapped, they have to now sell out or buy back their shares to, to get out of that position. That helps me to like, that would help push the stock a little bit further and give me extra momentum. Now, one thing I will add is that uh, um, for location, one of the reasons the hammer that I love the hammer, the reason that I love the hammer is this. There are three components that you need in any reversal. doesn't matter what reversal. So if you have a pressure move, so you've got a sell-off, let's say. So price is dropping. You've got selling pressure. 
in order for a reversal to happen, the first thing that has to happen is absorption. And what that means is that that as price is dropping, the buyers have to step in and start absorbing. They have to start taking on the selling. So they basically stop price from moving lower. That's what ends up happening. The next thing that you need in, in that is the pressure needs to kind of dwindle. The, the pressure, the selling has to subside. They have to say, okay, well, you know what? We're not able to push this. They get a little bit tired. And the way that I explain this a lot of times is like a tug of war. So if you've got you know, the bears on one side and the bulls on the other, and the bears are winning. They're pulling, 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 and the, you know, the bulls are about to dump into a, into a mud puddle. And all of a sudden, more bulls jump on, grab the rope, and they hang on. They keep the rope. They keep the rope from moving in any direction. The bears aren't able to pull the bulls into the mud puddle. So that's, them, that's where the absorption comes in. Then the bears start to get tired. They start to get tired. They can't push the price lower any further. So they start to go, okay, I need to take a break. And so some of them start to, to let go of the rope. So then that dwindles some of the pressure. The next component is the bulls have to actually take over and they have to push the price in the other direction, okay? The hammer candle has all three of those components built right into it. You've got the pressure that, that gets absorbed. So price stops. It settles out for a little bit and then they, the bulls are able to push it back up and it closes it at a higher price. So it's got all three of those components in it, which I like. So as far as location is concerned, one of my criteria is that a hammer can't be inside of a consolidation. That to me is not a, that's just a, that just happens to be where it opened and closed and it just formed a hammer. The hammer, you have to be at the bottom of a, of a pressure. You have to have some kind of selling pressure that was going into that move. Okay, that for location. Otherwise, it's it's not you're not absorbing anything. That's the reason that I like hammers, because they're great. They they uh, are a great visual representation of what a reversal looks like. You totally took my next question about the where is a good location for that hammer. Uh, I usually always try to find it in some sort of dip when I'm I'm looking at it. Yeah, you'd uh, want it as a dip, but you'd also want it as a support level. And the more things that you can, I guess, converge on, the better. So if it's at a moving average and it's at a dip and it's at a, a weekly support or at a daily support, the more of the ands you can get in there, the better it's going to be, right? Uh, I would say stock, the, the stock price moves up because people buy. Like if I buy a share of something, that stock depending on where I buy it and all that, that stock price will move, right? Maybe maybe me buying a stock is not as noticeable than obviously a hedge fund coming in and buying up stock, but that that pushes the price higher. So like Tracy said, if you there's multiple points that you could identify. So if I'm taking a day trade and I see a hammer in a, in a location that I could also scroll back on a daily chart and I'm looking for, all right, there's on a daily chart, there's also support there. I know that day traders might be interested in this spot, uh, maybe some people looking to get into a swing trade, more intermediate type of hold would be getting in, or also people that are maybe looking to a long-term invest or uh, build positions in this type of company. If you if you could identify on different time frames why people might want it at that price, that's going to give you a lot because now you have people buying on a daily, people buying for swing trades, people buying for a pyramid, people buying on a on a day trade, and that that creates the demand for that stock. And helps to to break it out higher. So, um, when Tracy said moving average, like honestly, and I think Tracy agrees, moving averages are pretty worthless because they're all they're all based off of previous data. Like if, if I'm looking at a, a 100 EMA, that's just taking the average price of the last hundred candles, right? So that's it doesn't imply where the stock is going to go, but people might look at like ever a lot of people have that 100 EMA on the screen. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because all the people are like, cool, if it gets down there, I'm going to look to buy. So if you're at that 100 EMA, you see a hammer develop or you see some noticeable trap or something like that. There's people that trade just based off the 100 EMA, right? So now you have one spot where some people for whatever reason might get in there. Maybe it's at another support uh, just as a retest for where it broke out of another pivot, right? And you have a little bit of a horizontal support there too. People trading that way might also find interest in that in that candle. Uh, you can look at volume too. So volume, let's say you're on a daily, you have a lot of 
volume coming in on that, that one hammer, that means there was a lot of shares exchanged. And as soon as you break that hammer, whoever got in there short has to close and therefore that volume should help push that stock up as well. So to have multiple reasons as to, um, especially in different time frames, and this is why like being a swing trader, you set up all your trades when the market's closed. Like you have a lot of time to really analyze the stock. You can spend an hour on each stock if you wanted to and just come up with reasons as to why you think that would be a good hammer to get into. Um, and the funny thing is, no matter, you can spend 12 hours analyzing that candle. It doesn't mean that that trade is definitely going to work. So it comes back to the fear a little bit. But knowing that you're okay with the risk that you're putting on that trade, because anything, you, you can come up with a million reasons why that stock should go up higher. And you might find it doesn't, right? For whatever reason, it just doesn't go higher. It ends up going lower. You get stopped out. But it's okay to get stopped out. That's perfectly fine to get stopped out. That's part of your plan was, all right, if I'm wrong, I'm setting my stop here. Same, same way, and I think we can get into a stop placement a little bit, Tracy, but same reason of how you would take your targets and say, this is the reason I want to get in. The same thing goes for where you would set your stop on that chart. So I'm going to look at the chart and say, all right, I have three reasons why people at different time frames might buy here. And then I look, okay, where, what's some reasons wh why, like where's a good location where I think, I'm just wrong on this trade or other people also trying to get in on this trade would also be wrong. And they look to sell, right? And it's typically under maybe that wick of where the bulls came in last time. Maybe it's at a, another pivot level, lower, whatever the case. But no matter what you do in the market, the market doesn't have to follow your thought process. And a lot of people get caught up in that. They're just like, ah, this thing should go up. This price is too low. And it just keeps coming down, 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 down. So by having, by having your stop at a spot where you're like, you know what? If I get stopped on this trade, I'm just losing my R. You know what your risk is. You know how much you're losing on it. And all you could do is set up your trade, right? Follow your plan, have your targets in place. And just knowing that, that should take a, a lot of fear from the, from the market too, because I actually get into trades assuming I'm going to lose, right? It, it helps me mentally in a trade. If I get into every trade, like this trade is going to be a home run. It's going to be a winner. It's more mentally... Um, it's more of a, a mental hurdle when it doesn't work because now I'm questioning why didn't it work? It was, it was the greatest setup. And then I'll see the same greatest setup next trade and be a lot more hesitant on taking that trade just because uh, uh, my, my confidence is kicked, right? I, I don't know why this trade didn't work. I see the same exact setup, but knowing that you back traded that setup a hundred times and you have a 60% win ratio on that setup. Okay, so the 40% didn't work. But you know, just trading that exact setup over time, over and over again, that will help you to that will help you to stick with the plan. Because even if you lose five trades in a row with that setup, you know historically by trading that setup, you're probably about to hit some wins on that same setup because your your ratio is your ratio. Like the the numbers don't lie. So if you hit if you miss five in a row, is it is it time to reevaluate that plan to to make sure it's there's not a flaw in it? So here's one of the things that you're going to get from back trading. When you back trade, you're going to get an idea of how many potential losers you could string together, right? There's a lot of things that you can get from back trading. Number one, you're going to know what your average win, what your average loss is. You're going to know how often, you know, your losers are going to string together. All of those things are going to, going to be available to you through your, your journaling. So if you have all that information, that's where you can start to compare once you start trading live with what your results were back trading, okay? And if you're deviating significantly from what you were back trading, that's when you start, you need to start evaluating what's going on because something's changed. And more often than not, it's something that you're doing, not something that the market's doing. Okay, so if I'm doing uh, some back trading, so I, I go back, say, you know, whatever, four months, and I find the, the first hammer candle that appeals to me, it's in the right spot for me, um, and, and I, I enter into it, let's just say, you know, four or five days down the road, another hammer candle comes out in, the, in a similar spot, I'm still in it. You know, I guess I get confused at that sometimes because 
should I have gotten in on the first one or should I get in on the second one also or or not at all? Wait till I'm out of it before I re-enter it. Yeah. So those are those are some advanced strategies that you can you can start to implement as you be become more comp confident as a trader. So until you understand how the math works and all that kind of stuff, then then yes, exactly that. If another hammer shows up, that's where I would add another R onto the trade. And I would only still have one R at risk because there's some cost averaging that's done and I would know where I need to put my stop and how I'd calculate that. So that at this point in your trading, I would just stick to the single candle and you wait until you're out of the can out of that trade before you enter into a new one. And as you develop as a trader, that's when you can start getting into some more advanced strategies where you're scaling in and out of trades. Okay. All right, and that concludes part three of our coaching session with Mr. Mike Pickett. Dan, any thoughts? Yeah, incredible to hear Mike Pickett. Glad that we had the opportunity to, to run through that portion of his trading plan with him. And don't forget, if you guys are just tuning into just this episode, we this is only part three of a four-part series. So if you missed part one and two, make sure you guys go back and listen to that. We do have a contest you guys could partake in as well that we're running all throughout the month of February as well. So you can go to reallifetrading.com, scroll all the way to the bottom. There's a link for our LT Pivot Podcast to catch those episodes and many, many more. Or catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or just check the links down below as well. Otherwise, uh, this is only part three of part four. Next one, we're going to wrap up the last and final half hour of the coaching session we have with Mike Pickett. Tracy, appreciate co-hosting with you as always. And for you guys that tune in each and every week, thank you very much. We absolutely love you. And we'll see you guys on the final episode of the coaching session with Mike Pickett.